Kia ora, I'm Erica Wilkinson, New Zealand's Acting Threatened Species Ambassador, and this is the Doc Sounds of Science podcast. Every episode, we talk about work being done behind the scenes by Doc's technical experts, scientists, rangers, and the experts in between. Kia ora, ko Erica Wilkinson tene, ke kona i purangi tene, e pa ana kinga Sounds of Science. Today we're talking to Jack Mace, Regional Operations Director for the Department of Conservation, Te Papa Arawhai. Kia ora, Jack. Kia ora, Erika. E tipu ake a hau i rotu i te maru o maunga tapu, e ino ake a hau ngā wai o te awa mai tai. Uh, he pākeha a hau no whakatū i te tauehu o te waka Maui, ko Jack Mace toko ingoa. I grew up in the shadow of maunga tapu drinking the waters of the Mai Tai River. Uh, I'm from Nelson in the top of the south. My name is Jack Mace. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thanks so much for being here. We are so lucky to have Jack here today. He is a regional operations director now, but he's worked across a bunch of different roles at DOC and as a result has some of the most fascinating conservation stories I've ever heard. Um, Jack's probably one of my favourite people to talk to about conservation because he is unfalteringly optimistic, enthusiastic, and he cares so much. So (laughs) under pressure to live up to that intro, Jack, do you want to give us a bit of an overview about your time at DOC? Sure. I started about 15 years ago in Nelson Lakes National Park, still my most favourite piece of conservation estate, although of course there are many contenders now for that title. My very first job was a temporary summer ranger trapping stoats. I actually applied to be a hut warden uh, and was declined for that job on the grounds that they didn't really think I might be able to talk to people and maybe I was just a little bit too interested in this biodiversity side of things. But Luckily, one of the staff there, Matt Maitland, took a pity on me and offered me a job as a stoat trapper instead, which was pretty good. Um, so I had six months there in the beautiful Nelson Lake, stripping around the mountains, got very, very fit very quickly. A typical day might be 20 kilometres of walking, climbing a 1,000 vertical metres in the middle of it through the beach forest. Um, from there, moved up to Taranaki, where I was a buttercup ranger, focusing on special plants uh, like our beautiful tiny buttercups that grow only in the coastal turfs. Uh, and from there, just bounce around a whole lot of roles, I guess. I've been a bureaucrat deep in the heart of Doc, trying to work to troubleshoot problems and make things flow more smoothly. I've trained rangers. Um, I've travelled all over the South Island and the North Island, monitoring plants, measuring carbon. And then for the last five years, I've been a manager of our operations team, so working alongside and leading some of our awesome rangers. That's so cool. I think Buttercup Ranger sounds like the most fun job of those, although there are so many. Um, and, and conservation runs in the family for you, doesn't it? Yeah, my dad was a fisheries scientist, but there's one story in particular where our paths did overlap in conservation. So when I was working in Taranaki, one of the other threatened species I looked over was the Poelephanta giant snail. So for those who are unfamiliar, these giant snails grow up to be the weight of a tui, and they're carnivorous. Famously, they suck up earthworms like they're spaghetti. Um, have a look on YouTube, it's pretty incredible. So there's a small population that's an isolated remnant on Maunga Taranaki, and they only live in the most awful vegetation in the Leatherwood Zone. Now, a couple of hours walk up, and if you know what cutty grass is, the snails live in the dead vegetation underneath, and then in those tangled, dense thickets of Leatherwood that are almost easier to walk along the top of than underneath. So even finding these snails is an immense challenge. We used to have to wear boiler suits and duct tape our sleeves around gloves to avoid ourselves getting sliced to pieces. Uh, we'd search all day, we might find one, two shells if we were lucky, but this incredible taonga of this carnivorous snail shell. Um, so my job was to look after these, and as a part of that I was looking through the old files that were held in the office, and I found a series of correspondence between the chief ranger of Egmont National Park, as it was of course called back then, and the chief of the Dominion Museum, where they were debating whether or not to prosecute my father for finding the first snail shell. And so it turned out that my dad had been there in the 70s tramping because uh, he grew up on the Maunga and he'd found one of these snail shells on the side of the track and being a zoology or a fishery scientist, he knew what it was and he took it back to the Dominion Museum in Wellington for ID. Um, little did he know that the chief ranger had heard there might be a snail shell up there and had planned a big expedition the next day to go and find it and dad had pipped him at the post and stolen his glory and so... Only by the good virtue and hard lobbying of the head of the museum did Dad escape a prosecution, something he knew nothing of until I told him this 35 years later. 
That's amazing. I can't believe that. I can't believe they'd prosecute someone. It's not really his fault for going to do that. No, but a welcome reminder, if you see some nature out there, leave it where it is, take a photo and tell someone about it that way. Definitely. So you you must have a, a multitude of conservation memories. Do you have particular ones that you tell around the barbecue, your your favourite ones? Yeah, there's a, there's almost an endless list. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> So there is a good one attached to that snail shell, which is we wanted to find out whether or not these snails were genetically distinct. The nearest population of the same species is in the Ruahine range, which is like miles and miles and miles to the east. And in between is all this low forested country where there's no poly fenter that are known. So how did this population come to be on this isolated maunga off to the west of the island? They must be genetically distinct, different species. And so we were working with Massey University and we had to go and get some genetic material from them. So to get that was a story in itself. The first thing we had to do was wade chest deep through the icy cold waters of the Stony River and then climb up one of the steep bush-clad spurs of the Poakai Range um, on the stormy windswept day with trees falling in the bush around us uh, and then spend eight hours searching in the driving rain for these poor little snail shells tucked in amongst this leatherwood. We managed to find a few And then we had to coax them out of their shells. And the way we did that was actually using a portable spotlight. So the snails, they need to be kept moist. They need to keep hydrated. um, And they'll try and seek shelter when they can. So they draw into their shells. But if the shells get too dry, then they have to come out and look for shelter again on the underside of that awful Garnier cuttigrass. So we'd shine this portable spot lamp onto the snail shells and they'd poke their little heads out and then we had to very quickly but very carefully take a tiny sliver off the edge of their foot with a scalpel. I say carefully because of course snails don't have blood clotting factor so if we'd gone too deep and cut into their vascular tissue Mm. they could bleed to death. Uh, So all those elements of having to be quick, having to be very very careful surgical precision all while in a howling wind and rainstorm upside down in the thickest scrub known to man on Taranaki. It was a very fun day. Oh, my gosh. And, and we found and, out hmm? that actually genetically they're almost identical to the Ruahine story. So far from solving the mystery, we we still have this mystery. How did they get there? Uh, for our listeners, I'd just like to point out that that entire story, Jack, was miming exactly what he was doing with the snail, and I, I wish that was on video. Um, you have mentioned a kōkako story being one of your, your favourites. Can we talk about that? Yeah, I love the story actually. So all across the centre of New Zealand are these immense rainforests. A lot of people, I suspect, don't actually know they're there. We sort of focus on the big grand mountainous places and think a lot of the central North Islands fly over country, but some of the most majestic rainforests are there in a big arc spanning from Taranaki and Whanganui all the way across to Te Uruera and the Raukumara. Um, this particular story is in a place called Puriora. So those who are familiar with the Timber Trail, this is the northern end of it. Uh, And this is actually the place where, in a lot of ways, modern conservation in New Zealand was born. So these massive ancient podocarp forests full of rimu, full of tōtara, were being progressively logged by the Forest Service. And a protest group called Native Forest Action set up there, and they occupied trees. This is their story to tell rather than mine, but long story short, they were successful in changing the minds of New Zealanders and causing the end of native forest logging. What's really cool about this place is you drive down this road through this cleared forest, some of it's farmland, some of it's pine, um, and you drive down the forestry roads and progressively it goes from farmland to pine forest to cut over native forest, and then ultimately you get to this really original big, big Rimu forest, uh, and you drive right to the very end of the road and there's a skid site where they would have hauled the logs, and this is where the logging literally stopped, where they abandoned the machinery. And if you go there at dawn, you'll see and hear Kōkākō sing, the grey ghost of the forest, the most haunting music you'll ever hear in the bush, and they're there. And if you know all of that backstory of that logging, not only do you see that journey as you go in, but you'll know that if it hadn't stopped, the species would have been functionally extinct. It would have only been a relic on a few islands. And so this place, this um, Puriota Forest, is the last great stronghold where we have enough peers to maintain enough genetic diversity. There's other satellite populations around, and those are increasingly thriving with the work of Iwi, with the work of DOC, with the work of really passionate community groups. But this was the real anchor population. And there, but for the grace of God and a lot of hard work by Fano, Hapu, Iwi, community and DOC rangers, this population would have disappeared. Oh, my gosh. And, and is it a stable population there in Puriora? 
Yeah, it is. Um, there's been a heck of a lot of pest control by a very passionate group of people there for a long time. And as a result, that's our most stable population. Fantastic. You've worked in conservation for a long time now. What species are you really worried about? Is there one in particular? Right now I'm really worried about a species called the Tuturuatu or the Churiwat. It's got two different names. The first is a Te Reo Māori name, the second is a Moriori name, because this bird, the shore plover, hails from uh, Reekohu, Farikori or the Chatham Islands. Now, I'm really worried about them because they're actually really, really threatened. They're as threatened as Kākāpō or Tākahe. Um, only a couple of hundred birds left, but they're particularly tenuous in that there's very, very few places where they can actually live. Um, for those not familiar with them, they're a shorebird. So if you think about uh, dotterels, oyster catchers, uh, torea, they're a similar sort of a bird. But this one, although once widespread throughout New Zealand, is now only found on two very small offshore islands of the Chatham Islands, so the remotest parts of our remotest part of our country. Why I'm really worried about them is not just because they're only on these two islands and at any time you know, their populations could be shattered by a predator turning up, despite all of our biosecurity work, but because you know, we often think, well, we can translocate them, we can put them to a predator-free island, but the habitat needs of these birds are very specialised. They need these exposed coastal platforms to live on, and so the list of islands they could go to in New Zealand is very small, um, but also that's hyper-vulnerable. So if you think about a kiwi population, you know, a stoat can come and it'll kill the young kiwi and they'll decline to extinction over time. But we know from experience a single rat coming onto these islands could completely wipe out the population very, very quickly. And we've had that with some of our translocated populations. We had some on Mana Island off the west coast of Wellington uh, and a single rat turned up and the birds all dispersed and within a very short time that population vanished. The other reason they're challenging is because they're really, really vulnerable to native predators. So we did another translocation a couple of years ago to Mana Island and it failed again. And we think it failed because there's a falcon that, that is resident on the island and it chased the birds off. So we end up with this conservation dilemma of one threatened species is attacking another threatened species that's much more endangered. We don't want to knock falcons on the head because there's only 5,000 of them. And so the options for this bird just are, are so narrow and limited and we're still trying to figure out exactly what can we do to make sure they've got somewhere secure for the long term. And and they're really territorial and quite um, almost not really <laughs> helping themselves, either they want to go and, and see what's happening and so um, they, they walk around their little territory. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. They're the cutest little bird. Again, I'd encourage people to get on and have a look at them. Yeah. These little black hats on. And I don't understand why they're um, they're not more well known as well. Like there are how many left? Is it two hundred and sixty in the wild or something? Yeah, not and many. No. But there's a lot of species that are like this. We often focus on what we like to call the glamour species or the charismatic megafauna of New Zealand: the kākāpō, the kiwi, the kōkākō. And look, I love all these birds and species to bits, but there's so many other threatened species and all of them are really charismatic in their own way, be they the little Canterbury knobbled weevil, the flax weevil, um, not even all birds. Uh, one of my earliest jobs is working with threatened plants and often when we're walking around we won't notice them, but if you're down on the coastal turfs, you get down on your hands and knees with a microscope, you'll see the tiniest little plants, you know, buttercups a millimetre across, massively threatened by introduced pasture grasses, really beautiful, but you wouldn't even know they're there. Yeah. Um, I absolutely agree in terms of the underrated species. I have fallen in love with the Canterbury mudfish as soon as I heard about it. And I can't believe how, how not well known it is and how it can survive out of the water for three months and how there's like this this electric fence to stop trout getting into its habitat. And it's just all these stories. I want them to be on the front page and they're not yet. <laughs> I love mudfish and they're so cryptic. I was working with some colleagues in Hokitika helping out one day as they were preparing some habitat for a mudfish translocation, literally just a scrubby swamp in the back of the airport. And they put a pallet down in the water to create some habitat, stood on it, it went underwater. When it flipped back up, there was a mudfish sitting on it and there were already mudfish. The ranger I was with, she dived to try to stabilise the pallet so we could check. And as she dived, she slipped and pushed it underwater and the mudfish was gone again. No. So very, cryptic. very funny. <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> but um, again, you look at these boggy swamps, these little ponds and forests, yeah. and you would never think there's these amazing little fish tucked away in there in the dried-out right. pond waiting for the rain. So in, in the face of so much loss, like 90% of wetlands are gone in New Zealand, the climate's heating up, 
it, it's so important to recognize and celebrate the wins. Do you do you have some wins that you're super proud of? The one actually that I really like, uh, we're recording this at the moment in Wellington, and I know that as I walk out the door from the recording studio, I'll be able to see car car flying around. If I reflect back to the 90s when in Wellington there were supposed to be six pairs of Tui, they were known by name, and to think how far we've come uh, through the work of Zealandia, through the work of the councils, and through the work of a heck of a lot of passionate people in the community, um, I could run to work from where I used to live in Western Wellington down to the city centre, and on a run I'd see a whole suite of species that you normally only see on an island. Tiake, Totowai, Kareareya, Kākāriki, Kāka, um, all there in the bush and all thriving. That's pretty cool. That is so cool. And I love how it's become like the thing that is almost a problem to have. Like, oh, the kākara, you know, messing up my roof or my my tree in the backyard. I just love that we get to have that problem in Wellington. Um, we don't yeah. have it in Christchurch yet, but fingers now, Rangers crossed. often get call outs for, um, you know, seals on the road or things like that. But Wellington's the only place I'm aware of where we're regularly called out to kākara in student flats causing havoc. <laughs> I bet. Can you tell us a bit more about the flax weevil? Yeah, these are these really cool uh, little weevils. Weevils are a kind of beetle. There's an incredible amount of diversity of them in New Zealand. These particular ones are these sort of big booty things about the size of your thumb joint. And they're only found on a bunch of offshore islands. So we've translocated them to some other islands, one of which is Manor Island, which I spoke earlier on off the west coast of Wellington. And it's a really good example of some of the dilemmas you face when you're too successful in conservation, which is we translocated them to Munner Island where they live on the flax, but they've been so successful there for some unknown reason that they're now eating all the flax and eating themselves out of house and home. And so one of my colleagues at Te Papa, Colin Miscali, is leading a program of work there just to try to understand why are they so successful and what can we do about that and how do you manage a species when you're over successful in the translocation. So sometimes translocations and conservation action can bring with them unexpected dilemmas. How how do you go about weighing up the options and, and balancing everything for the best benefit for conservation? It's a really good question. I think often when we tell stories of conservation, we focus on on kind of the successes or the failures and we paint them as black and white. But there's a huge amount of work that goes into all of them um, and really often a lot of judgment. I've always been blessed to be surrounded by really, really smart people who really know their stuff. And so whether I was a ranger or now as a conservation manager, I turn to the experts, um, whether that's whānau hapuiwi, mana whenua, whether that's our scientists from inside dock, colleagues from outside dock, uh, places like Wellington Zoo or Zealandia. I, and you seek the advice, you weigh it up, and then you make a plan and you go on that plan. Mm-hmm. Um, but always been really careful just to... Be, to keep the door open to new ideas, uh, conservation will often do what you don't expect it to, and you always need to be ready to adapt. Um, I'm reminded of a story. I had a, I was lucky enough to spend a season down in the sub-Antarctic islands um, in, based off Enderby Island, which is sometimes known as Club Med Enderby, purely because it has a freezing cold sandy beach and no sand flies. Um, but on this particular story I'm thinking of was on another island called Dundas, which I refer to as the hellhole of the South Pacific, possibly the worst island I've ever been to. It's about four hectares in size. The highest point is 14 metres above sea level, and that's a tussock. Uh, and it's an island where everything is grumpy. So these beautiful sea lion puppies that everywhere else just sort of sit there in big, warm, inviting looking puppy piles. On Dundas, they're angry. And if you're not careful, they'll come snarling out of the tussocks and try to bite you. But on this island, you know, this is a natural place. Very, very few people ever go there. It's one of our most protected places uh, with landing strictly controlled. But naturally, there have been these mud holes form um, where the banks have eroded over time and it's filled with this awful, awful chocolatey, muddy, quick sandy soup. The sides are made of peat, so it's very, very slippery when it's wet. And the sea lion pups can slip and slide into this mud. Uh, and naturally, this would have happened. All of the time, this would have happened and sea lion pups would have would have died. But of course, naturally, there would have been hundreds and hundreds of thousands of sea lions, and now there's far fewer, less than 10,000. And so the scientists that I've been working with um, had devised a very clever solution to this, which is they just built some ramps. So much like we might have a ramp to get out of the swimming pool, um, they built ramps into these pools, and one of our jobs was to go and maintain these so that the sea lions could get themselves out. So although a natural process, it wasn't predators or anything that was that was threatening these sea lion populations or these puppies, 
nonetheless, because they were so threatened, uh, the scientists had felt we do need to intervene in this case. So the best thing about working at DOC, I think, is always learning new things. Recently, I learned that female long-tail bats carry their babies around by their nipples and they can carry up to 80% of their body weight, which is just incredible. And I now tell everyone I've ever met that fact because I think it's amazing. Doesn't bear um, thinking about too deeply though, does it? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. Um, so what's, what's something that when you learned it, it just blew your mind? All right, bear in mind this is going to be quite nerdy, uh, but we often know about animals that mimic other animals, uh, wasps that mimic orchids, but do you know that New Zealand has plants that mimic other plants? And as far as I can tell, no one knows why. So this is a genus called Elzuosmia. The name itself, difficult to pronounce, almost like it's hiding within its own name. Um, but the one that I first came across, everyone's heard of Horapito, pepperwood. Uh, often a, one of the first practical jokes that gets played on you as a trainee bush person here, have some sugar leaf, you chew on it, and it's spicy and peppery. And so I tried to chew one one day in the bush, and it had no pepper, and I couldn't figure out why. Turns out there's a species called Elziosmia that perfectly, perfectly mimics horopito. And I say perfectly enough that when I've been doing monitoring work and, and, and going and redoing the work of some very expert ecologists, and they've said this area is full of horopito, and it's not. It's this other species. Um, and as you travel around the country, there's a range of species but they mimic other plants from completely different families. So when you go to the back blocks of Taranaki in the Whanganui, you'll see it mimicking pigeon wood, so big toothed leaves. When you go up to Northland, it mimics ramarama, one of our myrtle species um, that's got big, big bubbly leaves. And when you get your eye in, you can just figure out the little giveaways that tell you it's something different. But again, just crazy that we have these plants that, for some unknown reason, mimic a whole host of other plants around the country and mimic them well enough to fool even experienced botanists. That's amazing. And it's not for some defense mechanism or like blending them with the crowd so that no one eats them. They're not particularly tasty or anything. Well, I do need to put a caveat in here, which is um, I've been around Doc a lot. I've been around a lot of places. And as a result, I've got approximate knowledge of many things. So I think they don't. But if one of our listeners wanted to write us in and say why they have evolved like other plants, I'll be fascinated to hear it. Please do. We're, we're very keen to find out. And, and what's something that you tell other people to blow their minds? What, what's the kind of thing that you tell people that aren't conservationists, maybe? So first is that on the Chatham Islands, people use daisies for firewood and for fence posts. So the largest tree on the island is called Akeaki in Te Reo Māori, um, or Hakapiti in Moriori, and it's actually a daisy. It's this incredible tree. So it grows up, gets blown over in a storm, it'll plunge back under the ground and pop up again with another trunk, and it'll grow about as big as a kānuka um, or a young Wellington bahutakawa. And so as a result, you can use it for firewood, you can use it for fence posts, but actually it's a daisy. Amazing. And it's it's not threatened? No, it incredibly like tenacious. Well. The one problem they have on the Chathams is historically it was very, very heavily cleared. And so as a result, a lot of the forest is gone. But when you travel over there, you will see Akiaki or Hakapiti out in the paddocks and around the houses. And they love them over there. They're great trees. The other interesting fact is that New Zealand has the largest stinging nettle in the world. And when I say largest, again, this is the size of a tree, like the size of an apple tree. Probably every hunter in New Zealand will know this species from traveling around in the river valleys. Um, but they're massive and they have these big, jagged needles. You think about a nettle, and you know they're covered in these little bristly hairs. But this one's you can see very clearly. And they stab you just like a hypodermic needle. You know you've found this plant because you'll feel a sudden jabbing pain in your arm like someone stabbed you and for two or three days you'll be numb and itchy. From a hunter's perspective, these are horrible trees because you're walking around, you don't want to stumble in and get stuck in a grove of them. They have killed people in the past. Uh, people have had allergic reactions and heart attacks from being really severely stung. Um, but then what's cool about them is these are also where our native admiral butterflies live and where they breed and lay their eggs and what they feed on. So. Um, Again, this fierce species, its Latin name, Urtica ferox, the ferocious nettle, but then inside it, some of our most fragile and beautiful species. It sounds like it's pretty ferocious. That's kind of the Latin name that you want, isn't it? Like ferox, that's pretty cool. Just does what it says on the box. And I've got a Shut few up. friends, ranger colleagues, who in their careers have have been like sick enough to be bed bound for a couple uh -huh. of days after trying to push through it and not realising where they were in the night. Uh, Jack, have you been stung by this? So many times. In fact, one of my worst days out in the bush was when I was hunting deer in the Ruahines, 
and walking up a river and following what I thought was a deer trail, very, very intent on the ground in front of me and then looking up and realizing I was stuck in this patch of onga onga with apparently no way out and having to figure out how to get out without absolutely slaughtering myself. Um, another fond memory of what we called the leap of faith, we had a possum monitoring line, which when we do possum monitoring in the forest, um, we run lines straight. Eh? So none of this nice following spurs, following tracks. You start at a point on the map and you walk out on a compass bearing across whatever terrain is there. This particular line in the Tararua um, climbed up onto this massive fallen tree and then on the other side was this big death pit of onga onga. And so the only way to get past it was to do this giant leap of faith over the top and land on the other side. Um, luckily in this case, the penalty for failure wasn't severe. It was a very, very itchy, scratchy week. Um, but nonetheless, it was quite exciting, quite Indiana Jonesy feeling. Things you do for conservation. So you've had a lot of moments of on-the-job learning. Can you can you tell us about some? Yeah, often these are ones that revolve around learning an important safety lesson. And so in that first job when I was a stoke track in Nelson Lakes, uh, I learned really firsthand what they talk about where they say the weather is very changeable in the mountains. So New Zealand's mountains are among the deadliest in the world, not because of their height, not because of the, the steepness, but because the weather changes so abruptly. So an absolute bluebird day in summer in St Arnold in the Nelson Lakes National Park, we head up to the top of the range and set out about our work of checking stoke traps about 1,800 metres above sea level. Not a cloud in the sky. And about an hour in, I look over to the east towards Kaikoura and see this big black cloud on the horizon. Before I know it, it's there on me. And I had to spend 45 minutes hunkered underneath a rock while this blizzard and hail and snow rained down all around me. Gradually it lifted but it was just super, super murky. Like I could see my hand in front of my face just, but not at arm's length. As it increasingly cleared, I felt more and more confident, well, I can keep going. So I started walking and I was dead certain that I was walking down the top of a ridge. The sky cleared a bit more, just in time for me to realize actually I was dropping right down towards a whole series of cliffs and waterfalls where I had I've kept going for probably another five minutes, my number would have been up. So it was a really valuable lesson, uh, some might say in foresight, but certainly in actually we're often in a real rush to get work done. We're really compelled to finish the day's work, but actually the importance of just stopping and making sure the conditions are right and you can do it safely first. Um, and I was able to apply that lesson a lot then in future life, particularly as I became a, a leader of others. Um, so we had another place, a site up in the mountains above Franz Joseph, really, really steep 50 degree grass and um, what some of us will call diesel grass, one of our kind of Clyotusic species. It's called diesel grass because it's so slippery when it's wet that it's like someone poured diesel on the ground. You'll just go sliding. And so we had to do this work, this very, very steep plot, um, but we actually ended up having to wait an hour fidgeting, chafing at the bit to start until all the dew had burned off because we knew if we went out there while it was still wet, potentially we'd lose our footing and we'd, we'd slide. Um, even then on this site, it was steep enough that I had to apply what I call the penalty for failure test. And that's, if you think about it, we often do a lot of work to try to avoid something happening. That's really, really important. But it's also really important to think about, well, well if something does happen, if some unforeseen factor causes us to have an accident or an incident, well, what happens after? This is why our staff always carry locator beacons, why we have radios, why we have schedules in at the end of the day for remote work. Um, so I think of that as, What's the penalty for failure? In this case, the penalty for failure, if we did slide, would be uh, some bruises and maybe a broken ankle. Had it been actually a broken leg or a broken neck, then we would never have done that side at all. We would have just abandoned that piece of work. So it sounds like if you're, even if you're really experienced, you still need to be super cautious and aware of what the weather's doing because you just can't tell. Is that right? That's right. I mean, we do a lot of careful checking of weather beforehand, a lot of prep work, but. Um, I've done a lot of loan work in the bush. Uh, I've got colleagues that do immense amounts and the bush can always throw something new at you. So it's always important to make sure you've covered your bases, you're well prepped. Um, if you're going out, making sure you've got your raincoats, all your gear, even on a bluebird day, even for a short walk, that you've got the gear in case something goes wrong. You don't want to end up doing a leap of faith. I've read that you once had to put a penguin in a wine cask. What's been your weirdest day at work? <laughs> 
Well, funnily enough, that's not one of it. And just to be clear, <laughs> putting a penguin in wine cast was just a misguided attempt to try to hold it. Um, this is a rock hopper penguin, and they are really, really strong. So we had an empty cardboard box that happened to be from a wine cast that was empty, and we thought, could we use this as a kind of straight jacket to hold it? The answer was, no, we couldn't. Penguins are really, really <laughs> strong. Uh, but funnily enough, that wasn't the weirdest day. The weirdest days at work all seemed to revolve around poo. Um, so whether it was my first day learning that you can diagnose a kiwi poo by sniffing it, that led to my summer friends forever after referring to me as poo sniffer mace, um, to sieving sea lion poo, which is much worse than it sounds, to see if we could figure out what they'd been eating. <gasps> um, and if you ever want a job in conservation, I can strongly recommend not sieving sea lion poo. What, what do you do that for, just to check what they've been eating? Yeah, it was a study again by some of our sea lion scientists when I was down in the sub-Antarctic, just to look at what the diet composed of. So if you sieve through the disgusting yellow, oh. stinky yellow. liquid, you can get out some of the solid bits of squid that they've been eating. Charming. Ah, oh, you want to put that on your CV. Is, is there a particular poo that smells worse? Definitely the sea lion. I mean, kiwi poo are actually reasonably innocuous. They smell a little bit like ammonia. It's not that bad. But the sea lion poo, you know, you've got, fish oh. in there you've got oh. squid it's not good and it's yellow it's yellow seems unhealthy um, bilious yellow oh. <laughs> okay flip side tell us about your your best day at work what's been what's been the best so far um probably the first kiwi i ever found in the wild was a real highlight and there is a picture of me floating around that keeps haunting me. Most recently, my toddler daughter found, pointed out, Dad, 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 in a visitor centre. And there was this photo of me from 15 years ago. But it was in Nelson Lakes. There'd been a translocation of great spotted kiwi there. And there was a lot of survey work going on to see whether or not it had been successful. Were they breeding? Had we successfully been able to control predators enough for chicks to survive? And so we took the boat across the lake. We climbed right up to the bush edge alongside the Kiwi Ranger. Um, and we looked in a burrow where we knew a Kiwi was. And poof, mum Kiwi goes flying out at a million miles an hour. And he says, oh, well, she's gone. Just have a look in and see if there's a chicken there. So I poke my head in and lo and behold, there at the back of this burrow, right up on the tree line, is this beautiful little, uh, great spotted Kiwi chick staring back at me. Oh, my God. So, of course, God. they put a transmitter on the chick and they followed her through. Mum came back and that chick survived. To be an and adult, but absolute <laughs> highlight to find this fluffy, cute little kiwi chick. Awesome. And is there something that you wish that you'd learned sooner along the way? Just to get out there and do it. So I studied at university and uh, like many university students, I was very focused on the social life of it at the time. And some of my fellow students would get out and help out the lecturers. They'd go and volunteer for doc over the summer. I would have picked up on that earlier and I would have gone much harder. In fact, I would have gone when I was a teenager because when I think of all the opportunities for other stories that slipped me by <laughs> uh, that I could have been seizing, um, and there's so much opportunity now. There's so many predator-free movements. There's so many community groups out there working to restore species, even places like Wellington. you know, We've got Zealandia. We've got predator-free. There's opportunities to get out there and do it. So that's absolutely what I would have done. I would have started much earlier and gone much harder. And, and that's how you'd recommend getting a job in conservation, just yeah, getting out there? Definitely. Again, the best thing you can ever do to get a job is experience. And the wonderful thing about conservation is this everywhere in New Zealand, there's ways to get involved. Awesome. So we've got some pretty big um, and pretty ambitious predator-free goals, being predator-free by 2050. I mean, lots of islands that we're trying to get rid of pests on. What kind of critical things do we need to change in our toolbox we're definitely going to need some new tools. The ones we've got work, but if we think about the scale of New Zealand, we might have to start going beyond traps and poisons. We might have to start looking at things like gene technology, um, diseases that can actually come and do some of the work for us. We really need for people to, to see it as their work as well. It's not just something a government agency or some people over there can do. And mm. if I think again about Wellington, a predator-free Miramar, that we've almost got rid of every rat on that peninsula because people have got on board, they're doing it themselves, they're letting other people come in. Um, if every New Zealander cared enough to put a trap in their backyard to do some of this work, we'd be in a heck of a lot better place. Sure. So one interesting thing my colleague James Wilcox often talks about when he talks about predator-free Miramar and predator-free Wellington is he says he came into it from a conservation story 
Uh, but what he found was actually a really strong social driver. And the the impact of things like rats on communities and the the binding together that it could do for communities to be focused on getting rid of these these pest animals out of our homes and out of our gardens and out of our forests, that actually that social driver was much stronger than he'd ever anticipated. And so I think there's probably some gold for us there to think about not just the conservation outcome, um, the intrinsic value, the taonga value of these species and places, but also what it can do back for us, whether it's for our own health as we get out into nature, the feeling of achievement we have, uh, the feeling of being able to make a difference, or the social binding that it can do for communities as they come together around uh, an altruistic common good. It is such a social bond. It's pretty cool. Can you tell us a bit about what you've told me before about the Chatham Islands and how um, how diverse the um, the characteristics are over there? Oh, mate, the Chathams is just this amazing place. Like so much of our threatened species diversity is there. It's kind of like the Chathams is for New Zealand, what New Zealand is for the rest of the world. Everything's different. Everything's just kind of weird. So not only have you got these tree-sized daisies, but it's like all of the birds are just that little bit bigger. Probably the coolest or the most visible demonstration of this, though, is a bird called the pārea, which we'd know as a kukupā or a kereru, a wood pigeon. So the Chathams have their own endemic one that's only on the Chathams, um, almost went extinct as well. In fact, I think at one point it was down to about 45 birds left. And these things are mega. Like The scientists will say they're 20% larger than a kereru, but they look twice as big and they sit on the ground. So these are like the native cows. They graze the grass and there's one corner on the road in the south of the main Chatham Island where if you come around the corner, you have to slow down because on the other side of the corner, quite often there'll be a flock of these big pārea just sitting in the road and they waddle off slowly, (laughs) flap lazily over to graze on the grass. Um, But again, actually also a conservation success story and if anything – a story of accidental conservation success. So they're lucky enough to live in and alongside the largest forest remnant left on the Chatham Islands, a place called the Tuku Nature Reserve. It was donated by the Tuanui family who still farm out there next door. This forest is also home to the Taiko, which is the world's rarest seabird. Lots of the world's rarest things make their home out there. It's a bird that was only known from a single specimen collected at sea in the 19th century until it was found by the wonderfully named Davy Crockett and a band of others um, sometime in the 70s or 80s. And since then, like there's been an immense amount of effort to care for it, to protect the young from rats, from cats, from hedgehogs, from possums uh, that would predate them. And so this effort that was put into trap these predators and control them inadvertently also led to these pārea turning their numbers around and also starting to thrive. Uh, so again, far from collateral damage, it's a collateral success story. It is such a good success story. Jack, thank you so much for coming on. I've I've learned so much. I feel like there's been so much optimism around the conservation stories from your side. And I'm really grateful for that. It's buoyed me up for the rest of my day, that's for sure. We'll have to get you back on again, eh? Yeah, it's awesome. I'm looking forward to going out and gathering more stories. Um, there is so much good work happening everywhere that there are so many good stories being generated. When I think of you know, some of the work by like Ngati Tama and the White Cliffs of North Taranaki, um, some of the work Ngati Paroa are doing up in the Rokumana and Whanua Upper Nui, just knowing that there's this whole suite of new conservation leaders, new conservation workers, new conservation stories coming out. Um, I'm really looking forward to another 15 years of going and finding some more cool yarns to bring you. Awesome. We'll have to get you on again. Thanks so much, Jack. That's all for this episode. If you like what you heard, show us some love with a five-star rating. The Doc Sounds of Science podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts, so subscribe now, never miss an episode.